out here. Hi, Wes. How'd you go on down at Anfield? What's this? The directors go for your scheme, did they? You see the point about the longer shirts? That's the reason, don't it? The longer the shirts, the more room for advertising. <laughs> and like you said, with really long shirts, you'd save the expense on shorts. I sometimes think, Cyril, that everyone in this town with rubbish to flog is lying in wait out there, just watching until I go out. Then pow! They're in here making a mug out of you. I admit I said this morning trade was dead, but you didn't have to go and buy a hearse. <laughs> Yet another heat we'll never sell. That is where you are dead wrong. I got rid of one. Class exchange deal. What did you shift? Was it the Zephyr? Oh, come on. The Velox. You got shut of the Velox. Oh, be fair, Wes. No, it was a 78 Marina. But that's one of our top cars. I mean, it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Only in warm weather. All right, all right. Well, give me my half, then. Half what? Of what you got. I mean, you didn't do just a straight swap. There must have been some cash involved. Eh, uh, yeah. Fifty quid. Is that all? I knew you'd be pleased. He wanted two hundred. No way I said fifty is top. Hang on. You give him the marina and fifty quid for Count Dracula's Maserati out there. We haven't got a hope in hell of getting rid of it. Who wants to get rid of it? I was thinking, you know, nice roomy sort of vehicle. Just a thing for outings. Outings? Cyril, it's a hearse. It's for carton coffins about. You don't have to come, Wes. I was thinking of outings for me and Glynis. I mean, it's long. <laughs> Stretch out in the back. Oh, I see it all now. But, Cyril, you don't want a hearse. I mean, we've got a big roomy car out in the back. You know, the hump of snipe that's stacked on four piles of bricks. You can take Glennis out in that. Just what kind of girl do you think Glennis is? Well, if you really want to know... She is not the kind of girl who will go in a car with no wheels standing on four piles of bricks. If you must know, Glennis will only go in a car if a bona fide journey is involved. Now, it doesn't have to be all that far. One time, the car would not start. I just let the handbrake off and pushed it a yard or two. <laughs> but the point is, Glynis is particular. The car has to move. I don't want to hear the details, Cyril. Look, we did not go into the second-hand car business... Pre-owned. So, the pre-owned car business, so that you could subsidise your bizarre courtship rituals. And that hearse is a dead loss. And no matter what Glynis may think, I am not taking it lying down. We could hire this house. There's a lot of do-it-yourself funerals now. People hire the hearse. They do. They hire the hearse and make their own arrangements. I was told that by a bloke in the business. Well, who was that? Paddy, the bloke who bought it off. Paddy. Paddy! You did get the logbook. God, you think I'm on mug, don't you? Of course I've got the logbook. I can't make head in the tail of this. Because it's in Irish, that's all. <laughs> So it's not even an English clapped out hearse. It's an Irish clapped out hearse. Cyril, this hearse has got to go. All right, clever dick. All right. Go ahead and sell it. But like you said yourself, who wants a hearse? Vincent Price used to give me a lift in a hearse like this. Did you say Vincent Price? Which Vincent Price is that, then? You know. You see him in them horror films a lot. He used to drive one of these for the co-op funeral department out of <laughs> Oh, yeah. He'd like you to think so. Comes from up the dingle, Vincent Price. Got all that American talk with hanging about with the Yankee lads at Burton Wood when the war was on. Ma'am, if it was the same Vincent Price that used to drive one of these for the Prescott Co-op, how come he got very big in Hollywood? Same way as he got his job with the Co-op, I dare say. His dad was very big with the Masons. <laughs> Leave the brain work to me, Cyril. <laughs> Oh, there, Mr. Nesbitt, how are you diddling? Oh, Wesley, settle. Where is the hearse, then? Ours? We just come to call on you, Mr. Nesbitt, to tell you that me and Cyril, well, we're like joining the profession. Well, you're never setting up as undertakers. <laughs> well, the way we figure it, Mr. Nesbitt, to a lot of people, 
death is the best way they've got of getting out of Liverpool. <laughs> Who's that in the ocean? Is that your first client? <coughs> Mr Nesbitt, that is an unworthy remark. And but for the high esteem in which I hold you, I would have to put the nut in. That is me, man. Oh! I do beg your pardon, Mrs. I'm sorry, lads. I got a bit choked when you talked about going into competition. I've had it up to here with cowboy undertakers. You don't know me, Mr. Nesbitt, but I know you. You put my cousin Eunice under. Eunice that's from Nelson Street. I'm sorry, love. I know the name, but I can't just put a body to it. <laughs> We're trying to talk business, you know. The thing is, Mr. Nesbitt, we're just paying a courtesy call. You know, since we're going to be professional colleagues. The recession is definitely bottoming out. So on past form, there'll probably be more jobs in London and more funerals around here. Don't expect me to say three cheers and welcome, lads. The profession's bursting at the seams. Sorry you feel that way, Mr. Nesbitt. But we've already bought the earth now. But if we could find a buyer for it, things would be different, like... Just, uh, come in the office, lads. We have to go through the embalming room, so uh, don't hang about when we go through there, love. It's ingrained in my lads. Anything that doesn't move, they get the needle in and it's on the floor. The thing is, Mr Nesbis, around our way, in the flat's life, they're crying out for a good cheap funeral. We'll be giving them no frills, no hidden extras interment. Satisfaction, or your loved one back. <laughs> well, uh, I'm warning you, lads, you know, it's full of grief, the funeral game. I mean, people let you down like there's no tomorrow. I'd be doing you a favour taking that ass off your hands. It is a genuine vehicle, isn't it? I mean, it hasn't been raced or rallied. <laughs> Mr Nesbitt, no way has that vehicle been used for joyriding. I mean, Mum's grave. Where is your mother? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I don't go and there, Mrs. You don't realise what goes on in a job, do you? Do you see behind the scenes? I think it's wonderful the way they make the dentures gleam like that. <laughs> <coughs> now then, uh, uh, how much would you think they're asking? 500. It is a vintage vehicle. Well, I dare say I could use it, but uh, it's the old cash flow, you know. Uh, what about a part exchange? Oh, we couldn't entertain another hearse, Mr Nesbitt. It's not a vehicle I'm offering. Uh, Siddle, have you ever looked ahead to the time when, uh, like it or not, you have to depart from this veil of tears and shuffle off this mortal coil? No. It comes to us all, Cyril, leaving your loved ones grieving, heartbroken, and facing heavy expenses. Yeah, but don't keep looking at me. Tell her, was he? But you're older than him. And anyway, you don't look after yourself. You drink, you smoke, and you look to me like a snooker player. He is. Like his father before him. So? It's exercise, isn't it? Exercise? Smoke-filled room? <laughs> Bending over a table, cramping all your internal organs up? Your dad was a lovely player, Cyril. Your dad? I thought you always told me he had bad eyes. Well, he had. Specs like beer bottle bottoms. <laughs> no, he was like a bat, you see. Played off the echoes more than anything. All right, all right, but let's get back to the air, shall we? I mean, time is money, Mr Nesbitt. What are you offering? Let me show you something. Very unusual, that, Mr. Nesbitt. Yeah. Difference. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't chuckle it's different. There's only one such monument in the old world, lads. The work of a master maestro, Neville Tupper. If that man could keep up the Bacardi, his stuff would be in the art gallery. Amazing. Amazing. Fantastic. You can see the concentration in his eyes. I should say he was planning to put top spin on his shot. One day, Cyril, <laughs> your name could be on that stone. You could be somebody in that cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Mr. Nesbitt, we're not buying gravestones, we're selling a hearse. I'll buy your hearse, Wes, at your price. 500, made up as follows, to wit and viz. This unique work of art, plus 100 in your hand, in readies. I tell you what, Wes, I quite like it. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Queen, man. 400 quid so our Cyril can have his ego massaged. <laughs> Cyril? For Cyril's dad? It's a dead spit of him. Never could afford a posh funeral. Not a stone, neither. Uh, you wouldn't deny your dear old mother, would you, lads? 
Uh, you'd have to throw in the inscription on the stone, like. Oh, I'll throw it more than that. <laughs> Neville wrote a, a tremendous piece of poetic tribute. It's, uh, written there. You can have it all on the stone. There. What do you think of that, Mrs. McGregor? God saw you were tired and thought it best to lay your cue down for a rest. <laughs> he gave you just a gentle push and down you went in off the coast. <laughs> It's the Nesbitt. Got yourself a deal. Well, I think it's ever so romantic. You putting a stone up for him after all these years. By rights, Glennis. You should have had a stone off them he worked for. Let's face it, but for an accident at work, he'd still be here today. Well, when I say here, I mean he'd be down at the snooker hall today. <laughs> but I thought you said he was hit by tram. Trying to get half a crown that was stuck in a tram line. <laughs> that was his work, love. Inspector he was, youngest in the service. Like a, like a wartime commission, you know, with them as could see being away in the army. Oh, yeah. Killed in the line of duty, he was. Well, between the lines of duty, they couldn't deny <laughs> that. Mind, there was a lot never come out. What do you mean? Well, by rights. There should have been another three minutes before that tram hit him. It's my belief they was rushing to get a pint in at the terminus. Well, there was a lot got hushed up. Such as what? Well, they swore blind that his watch stopped when the tram hit him, and according to that, they was bang on time. But Mrs. Allett was coming out of the crown and kettle at the time with a jug. She run to him. Never spilled a drop, mind, in there over 80. And she told me that his watch was still ticking when they carried him into the pub. If you ask me, there was dirty work at the tram sheds. Suppose him being an inspector, he'd made enemies. Ah, there was a lot that smarted under his lash. In fact, a lot of people said to me, that tram driver could have been a lot quicker on the brake handle. <laughs> How anyone could mistake the glint of Cyril's dad's glasses for lamplight dancing on the wet cobbles, I do not know. Mm -hmm. At the inquiry, they said no blame attached. In fact, one little tab end of a fella tried to chuck it all on Cyril's dad. They wouldn't give him a stone. They had to agree on a plot, though. So they did the right thing by him? Grudging, Glenys. Very grudging. We'll supply the rest in place, Mrs McGregor, they said. You'll have to find the gravestone. <laughs> I'd have had more chance finding a gallstone. <laughs> I tell you this, Glennis, they'd have given him a stone if it had been a mason. Yeah, sure they would. Betting slips or no betting slips. What do you mean, betting slips? He had 17 in his pocket when he was struck down. <laughs> not his own, Glennis, not his own. No, he used to carry them for other people out of the goodness of his heart. He liked helping people. The Samaritan. Couldn't do enough for you if he wanted to get a bet on. <laughs> And he never got the commission off them 17 bets. Look, he said there was null and void. Typical. Three of them was winners and all. He liked to gamble, did he, Cyril's dad? No, he didn't hold with gambling. Only on the horses and the dogs and the game of cards. But he didn't hold with gambling, no. He used to say you wouldn't get him in a casino at Monte Carlo, even if it was free to get in. And his grand passion, really, was snooker, I believe. Never out of that temperance billiard hall. Here, I say, Glennis, I bet you don't know where that is. Afraid you've never heard of it. You only work there. The blue cockatoo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the temperance billiard hall of ours. Oh, it's right what they say, Mrs McGregor. There's a destiny that shapes our ends. <laughs> he preferred being in the temperance to being in a pub, you see, Glennis. Like he always said, there's no that closing time nonsense in the temperance. You can always get a drink in there. <laughs> well, I always thought it meant, like, teetotal temperance. A lot think that. Oh, I can see him now, Cyril's dad, standing in the bedroom of a night trying to get his trousers off. Your true temperance, Dolly, used to say, your true temperance is moderation. And then he used to fall over. <laughs> Oh, 
flaming time. Language, Siddle. You are in a cemetery. He never done up of eight man an hour all the way. <coughs> Only been out of first gear twice. I'll tell you something else and all. He's come in this cemetery the back way, hasn't he? Why didn't he come in through the front gate, eh? Yeah, funny that. I'll ask him. <laughs> Shush! Stop that! What's up? We'll have some decency. You're in a cemetery. That's to tooting on the horn, Cyril. That's the last thing some of the people in here ever heard in life. Why have we come in the back way? What was wrong with coming in through the front gate? We're here, aren't we? Now look, uh, is that where you put Siddle's dad or not? Yes, that's the one. Next to Armitage Edward, sleeping, gently sleeping. Sli exactly, sleeping. That's why we don't want to go around tooting car horns and generally making a row. You come all round the houses getting here. I thought you was open to have it dark. I come the pretty way, didn't I? Past the sewage works. That's all comparative, <laughs> Cyril. Past the sewage works, yes. But still pretty in some ways we could have come. Yeah. Nigel, careful. Chuck her out with the truss is no use to me. <laughs> Come here, lads. Gently. Gently. <laughs> Shut up! Keep your voice down! I shouldn't let him be down again! Oh, you keep telling him to be quiet. I don't know, Les. We get a lot of that at the club every time he sings. Yeah, well, I'll tell you something else. The only funeral I've ever been to where they kept the engine with the air running. I don't see now what you meant, Mrs. McGregor. It's not your run-of-the-mill gravestone, is it? Uh, I haven't got my glasses with me, Dolly. What words did you settle on in the finish? The balls were grouped, your cue was chalked, you bent to play your shot. St. Peter switched the lights out and said, you've had your lot. What are you about? Let's get on with it. All of a sudden, you're in a hurry. It'd be nice if you had the vicar saying a few words. The vicar? You should not want the vicar. He's charge here, you know. He's very grasping, the vicar here. It'd be nice to have him, though. I'll nip down the chairs there. Give him a shout. No, there's no use you nipping down the chairs, Cyril, because he'll not be there. He's always mooching around the pier head about this time. The meth drinker's padre, they call him. I say! <laughs> oh, hellfire! <laughs> uh, what is going on? What's that monstrosity doing in my cemetery? Here, do you mind? That cost a lot of money, that's it. Uh, might I say a word, Vicar? This lady and her son's here. I fashioned a very worthy memorial to her late husband. Speaking as one who has to study what pulls the punters in, I reckon you've got a very definite asset to your graveyard here. Well, that obnoxious is not staying there. I permit a simple stone or a plain cross. Leave it to the whims of the bereaved, and the place will be full of cherubs, archangels, garden gnomes reading prayer books, or Yorkshire terrors with their heads winsomely on one side as if to say, where's the master gone? <laughs> exactly. I wouldn't care so much, but that snooker-playing monstrosity has been refused entry once before, as you know full well, Mr. Ne Nesbitt? Is that right, Mr... Mr. Nesbitt? You're asking me to sue him? Exactly. Our Wes was all for going round there with Chapel of and doing him. I said, Wesley, if we do that, Magna Carta died in vain. We shall seek redress through the law. Then we go down to Chapel of and do him. Very commendable, Cyril, but uh, if you let me get a word in, which I advise, since you'll be paying for my time, I can't sue Harry Nesbitt for you. You'll have to get another solicitor. But I always have you, Mr Cox. In the first place. Harry Nesbitt's already been on to me. I've agreed to represent him. What a liberty! Everybody knows you're my solicitor. Hey, and what a giveaway. Shows he's guilty. <laughs> Let's face it, Mr Cox, anyone who comes to you... All oh, <laughs> right, sir. In the second place, he wants me to sue you. Sue me? What for? When driving away from the cemetery yesterday... He shot away like a scalded cock. And, in my hairs, what he got from me by fraud or trickery. That hearse is mine. There is some evidence that he was driving at speed. 
As it happens, the police stopped him. Claimed he was doing 80 on the ring road. <laughs> In my desk. When discussing the speeding and sundry other matters, they ran your hairs through a computer. Turns out to be on the warm list. Stolen in Dublin last week. <laughs> not my hairs, Mr Cox. Not to do with me. That's not what Harry Nesbitt thinks. Or the police. Surprised you haven't had the visit yet. I acted in good faith, Mr Cox. Bought that hairs and a bona fide deal off a chap I took to be a bona fide punter. I mean, he had the logbook. Oh, yeah. The logbook. In Irish. Well, being an Irish document, it would be. The police have had it translated. That logbook, Cyril turns out to be a document entitling a nursing mother to free orange juice. <laughs> and by the way, my client wants his gravestone back. He's had that. My mum sucker fancy to me. But if she can't put it on your dad's grave, Cyril, what the hell is she going to do with it? Well, I thought that vicar was most unfeeling. What about that poor Mrs Wellsby? Her vicar refused to marry her in her second. Stood there in the church, there was. Because she was divorced? No, that was the trouble. It hadn't come through. <laughs> Just shows you, Glennis, there's always somebody worse off than yourself. <coughs> Elizabeth Taylor, she's one I feel sorry for. Glennis, here you are, Dolly. It's very nice of you, Colin, to have the stone here at the club. Yeah, and anyway, ma'am, you want people to see a stone like that. There's a lot more people comes in here than goes in that graveyard. <laughs> Basically... This place and the graveyard do share the same clientele, Wesley. But I get them only when they're dead from the neck up. And while they're still spending. In my view, Dolly, you could not have a more fitting place for a tribute to the memory of Cyril's death. That's true. Because when it was the temperance billiard, all he spent more time here than anywhere. Except at home with you and little Cyril. No, including at home with me and little Cyril. I don't know why he never took much of a fancy to little Cyril. Well, all his old pals will be able to contemplate this stone now. I mean, they'll think of him every time they see it. His memorial is going to be useful too, Dolly. I was going to have to get something. Are we right then, Nige? You are wrong, Glove. Good crap, Mrs McGregor. Oh, I was just thinking of something Cyril's dad used to say. When I hadn't got his tea ready or he was feeling a bit sorry for himself. What was that? When I am dead and gone, he used to say, you will not be able to treat me like a convenience. <laughs>